Good afternoon. How are we feeling? It's been a pretty exciting day. I'm Deb Wanger. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm Matt Sheehan. I'm with the University of Florida. Um, <laughs> thanks, Dave. Heckling, heckling, heckling. A rite of passage for Journalism Interactive. Before we get to our next part of the program, which is probably one of the most exciting parts for me, uh, mostly because it is one of the fastest moving and I learned the most in the short amount of time, uh, and we're, we're all busy and, and have important things to do, so this is a great opportunity for this. But this is our third, and, uh, third time of doing this program, which has kind of become a signature for Journalism Interactive. We started it in 2011 and completed it again in 20, what was last year, 13. Uh, I'm losing track of years down in Florida where we hosted it. Um, but before we get to that, I want to give a shout out because uh, so far today has been just phenomenal. So I want to recognize again Leslie Walker and Kalyani Chada, the co-chairs for this year's Journalism Interactive. It's, it's been a great day and we should also give our appreciation to Sean Musadin, the wizard of JI back there over at the AV table. So we're very excited about this, our third Teach-a-thon. We have, uh, Deb's gonna tell you a little bit more about the program uh, in a second, but I just wanted to also thank Deb for putting up with me for three years and doing this. Um, but it's been a great ride and we're really excited about the, the speakers that we have tonight. Um, and then we'll get to the reception later in the dinner tonight, which we're very much looking forward to. So Deb, take it away. Um, thanks a lot. So I will not eat into the time of our presenters other than to say, we have 11 great teachers coming up here to tell you some of their best practices within the classroom as it relates to innovative teaching. Um, they each have seven minutes. I told them the fate of the free world does not depend on them sticking to that time, but we will try to keep it as close to seven minutes as possible. Questions for everyone at the end. We'll drag them all up here to embarrass them in front of the group. Um, so if you have a question, please save it to the end. And with that, we will go ahead and get started. So our first speaker is Jeremy from Lehigh. Um, so I'm going to talk about Google Glass. Um, and I'm, this is a small sliver of what I'll be, I'll be presenting with Mike Riley from DePaul tomorrow in, in one of the training sessions. Um, I'm going to talk today about some of the things that we did in my multimedia storytelling class. We did a class last fall with 10 students and each of them got this device for 10 days spread out over the course of the semester. And um, tomorrow we'll walk do more things like a walkthrough. But I want to talk today about some of the things we learned about ways in which you can make use of this device in your class um, if you have, you're crazy enough or rich enough to have $1,500 to spend on such a thing. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what, where my focus has been. It's been on the camera. Um, this is the Google Glass. You've probably seen these worn before, but there's a camera right up here. Um, and so I look like a Borg, but up here is a five megapixel camera, and it takes, so it's, it shoots in photos in five megapixels, and 720HP, uh, 720p HD video. And so we've been focusing on the camera aspect. There's a lot of other things you can do. There's a ton of space to play, but I want to talk a little bit about what we were doing to, with this thing, because the camera has been the focus of, of what we do in that class. Um, so I want to give you a couple ideas of, of different types of assignments that we did in this class um, uh, to, to kind of just maybe get you some ideas going. If you have any others or things you want to ask about, I'm more than happy to talk about it. Um, I'm very interested in this idea about first person. Glass on your head is different than a smartphone out in front of you. Uh, and a lot of what we do in journalism is based on the idea of third person um, information gathering. We're pointing a camera at something. We're experiencing um, the thing that we're witnessing through our own eyes. And Glass gave us an opportunity to maybe think about how can we flip this paradigm around? How can we start thinking about stories in ways that journalists don't traditionally do, which is the first person aspect of it. Um, so very simple assignment that I gave them early on was to go out and, and shoot something akin to an event. They go out and take some photos of it. Um, Glass has a Wi-Fi um, antenna inside of it, um, which allows you to, if you're on Wi-Fi at the moment, you can instantly share um, a photo or video that you take to social networks, Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, Google+. Um, gives you that kind of instantaneous sharing. If you don't have, if you're on Wi-Fi, you can pair it with Bluetooth um, to a smartphone and take advantage of your four, 3G, 4G, LTE connectivity and share it that way. So 
the first thing we tried to do is, okay, let's, let's do it like a traditional journalist. We'll, we'll make some comparisons to mobile phones. So they were, they were writing some assignments up and making some comparisons like, what's this like shooting with this thing on my head versus holding it in front of me? Um, just to get to know the device and, and then help them kind of think about what this thing can do. Um, that was the first level of things that we tried. Um, <laughs> I swear to God, this was not that kind of session. <laughs> Welcome to Maryland, folks. Don't worry, this okay. doesn't count against your time. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's good. This is extra time. This is like soccer. Um, okay, so I'm a little rattled. What are we supposed to do? Um, so that was the first level of assignments was, okay, getting them to think about the device. The second level was um, uh, a little more about getting them to start thinking about it first person. So I gave them a very simple assignment. Go out and shoot something that's visually interesting through someone else's eyes. So you have to start thinking about stories in different ways. Um, and so what they were required to do is, is shoot with glass on their head. They were shoot an intro of the person who the story was about, and then put glass on their head and let them film some activity that they were doing. So I want to show you one of the videos that we was done by a class of a, in my class by a student named Becca. Who raise your, raise your hand, Becca? Wave to everybody. She did this video. And you'll see the moment where they put it on her head. So as a shop monitor, um, I sit at a desk, basically, and I um, watch people using tools. I will pay attention to if they're using tools correctly and safely. Um, I will also make sure that the shop stays um, clean as part of safety reasons. Um, and I also... Okay, I messed that up. <laughs> Do we have a web browser on this thing? Okay, I'm going to pull that up really quick. Um, my apologies. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm adjusting on the fly. Um, she had she had a second one, and I ended up, I think I downloaded both of my hard drive, and I uploaded the wrong one. So the good thing is I know how to search YouTube. Um, that's not it. This one right here, right? Okay, good. And now we go. I'm not. We are in the Chandler Almond Design Lab, and I'm a shop monitor here in the woodshop, and I make sure that um, everyone is using tools safely, so they're working properly, and I'm going to show you. Now, you can tell more deep, complex stories, um, but this was kind of our way of doing an entry point into getting students to start thinking in first person. In fact, this assignment was called You're the Director, which means that you have to go out and, and rather than thinking about the producer or the shooter, you have to be the person who is thinking about what it's like to be behind the camera without actually being able to see it. So you have to start visualizing stories in different ways. Um, we, we tried, this, is a, this has been a pretty successful assignment. So we're going to be producing at the end of, of the class is what it's called a glassumentary. 
Um, that, that is still to come in this class, but we had a whole set of them that were produced last semester. It's a documentary for the web of about four to six minutes, um, and I'm requiring about half of the footage to be shot in first person. So there, the, the, when I haven't had a glass of wine, I say we're, we're trying to play with storytelling forms. When I've had a glass of wine, what I say is we're inventing a story form that has never been seen in human history. Um, that is probably, it's, uh, I'm embellishing a little bit, right? But I mean, we're, we're trying to figure out how can we start playing with the way we do journalism um, by incorporating um, points of view that we're, we're normally used to pointing a camera at and looking at. So I'm gonna give you two resources. You can come to our session tomorrow if you wanna hear more. I'll demo the device. Um, glassjournalism.com, I have posted my syllabus in the, in the teaching resources section, so if you want to see t resources for syllabi and assignments, go ahead and look at that. You can download them, you're free to use and remix, um, I don't care. Um, and so you can definitely take a look at that if you're interested, um, and uh, the rest I'll share at my session tomorrow. So, thank you. Next up, Doug Ward from the University of Kansas. Ah, Jeremy has it. Okay, well, if Jeremy is talking about success, I'm going to talk about failure, which is, which is what I had in crowdsourcing a syllabus. Let me give you some background in that I had recruited some faculty members to teach an online class for intercession this January. One by one, things went bad. One by one, people dropped out or various things happened. And guess who was left standing to teach the intercession class in November? That was me. I went forward and I said, okay, I'll create one. I have not taught this class before. It starts the last day of December. I haven't taught it before and I thought, I will give the students the opportunity to weigh in on what they want to learn, on how they want to learn it, on how I'm going to grade them, on what they're going to be doing on everything. And I thought, what an opportunity. It was a, cl a class in, it was an online class, mostly online. The last week of the class, the last of the four weeks, we met in person a couple of times. Otherwise, it was all online. I set up a Google Doc. Anyone who emailed me, I gave access to the Google Doc. And I said, here's what I've started with. Please give me your feedback. I said, thoughts. I asked for, for input in a lot of ways. I sort of gave them prompts, expecting them to jump in. I actually, when students uh, had to come to me for permission, there were 15 students in the class, when they came to me for permission, I said, go to the Google Doc, you have an opportunity to add your comments to it. Man, I was so excited, I was envisioning this, I was envisioning everyone jumping in, and everyone was gonna contribute to this, and everybody was gonna be so happy, and I ended up with something like this. So I went back to the students afterward, and I, started thinking, well, why? And this is when I, I put this proposal in before I taught the class, before I, before I had any idea about how this would turn out. Okay, I, I can learn from it. So what did I learn? Well, I went back to students and I said, well, why? And some of them said, well, I didn't want to look stupid. I didn't really know what to put. It was a class, it was a topic that I didn't know that much about. I didn't know the other people in the class and I didn't want to look stupid. Okay. I mean, I realized it was also at the end of the term. Students are busy. They're worried about trying to figure out how am I going to finish this semester. They're not really thinking about what am I going to do after that either. I had another student who said, rule number one, always don't make the professor mad before the first day of class. <laughs> she didn't know me. And the way that I teach really is to put more of the responsibility on students for their own learning. And I'll get to that in just a minute. And I'm always open to this. And yet, they come and they're, they're used to having people be mad at them for things and they don't want to be, they, they feel like they're really in the, uh, they're really at the uh, mercy of the professor in a lot of ways. So they're, they're very careful about that. They don't want to look dumb. Uh, makes sense to me. Uh, and yet, 
that's what online culture is about, is about that participating. It's about that participating. So I, I said, what can, I, what can we take away with this? One is that I think that the students don't have much of a model for this, at least in education. Yes, they participate in online culture in a lot of different ways, in tweeting, in Facebook, in all sorts of ways, uh, in creating websites. They're not used to that with education. They really aren't. They're used to being told what to do. I think that if you do this, or if I continue to do this, I think others are going to have to do it as well. If I'm the only one who's doing it in my department, and I will probably be the only one who will be doing it in my department, students don't have that, don't have that experience. They're much more comfortable doing things when they have some experience and get the feedback and realize, oh, okay, this isn't such, that, such a difficult task after all. The other one, the last really, is that we have to encourage them to be more proactive. With my classes, I put a lot of onus on the students to tell me what it is that you're going to learn. I want students to set their own learning goals, and then I want them to design projects around things that will allow them to meet those goals. And much of the time, I get blank stares. Sometimes I get hostility because I'm supposed to tell them what to do. Well, you're the teacher. Yes, I am the teacher. But in today's world, it's really about collaboration. And that's really what I push. And I think that students are still not used to that. And I think they have been trained for all the time up till they've got to us that someone tells them what they need to learn. And I will memorize it, and I will give it back to you. It's not how can I participate in creating my own learning. So, if you try this, those are my lessons, uh, and I don't know that uh, I will do it again, but it's, it, be prepared for a challenge. So that's my, that's my lesson from failure. Please welcome Jennifer Cox, Salisbury University. <laughs> How can I beat that? Well, first things first, I'm going to win that selfie contest. So uh, <laughs> smile, guys. <laughs> Vote for me. All right, so uh, today I'm talking about accuracy and Storify. And what I did with my students, this was a mobile journalism class that I created at Salisbury University, just over the bridge for those of you Marylanders in the crowd. And uh, what we did was uh, I, I kind of wanted to show students how to kind of emphasize the dangers of putting out misinformation using social media. And I thought Storify was a really good tool to do that. So uh, a little bit about the lesson itself. The first thing we do, and this class is organized into a Tuesday, Thursday kind of a uh, situation. So on Tuesday, what we typically do is we have a discussion about a particular practice in journalism, in, in mobile journalism. And uh, it involves the ethics, the challenges, the opportunities, things like that. And so for this particular lesson, we talked about some of the pros and cons of online journalism. Uh, the first of which is the question we always ask, is it better to be first or right? And everyone in this room knows it's both, right? Of course it's both. And students always say, well, of course it's both. But they don't understand really how hard of a thing that is to accomplish. So we do this little exercise to teach them how to accomplish that. Um, so what are some of those challenges for online reporters? Obviously, there's speed. And uh, those of you guys who are tweeting right now certainly know it's, it's hard to, to kind of tweet and pay attention at the same time, get the information right and out there fast and first. There's no end to the news cycle. So uh, if you never go to sleep, I suppose you'd be the most successful journalist there ever was. Uh, instant gratification audience. We always want to know what's going on. All of us hit our phones instantly as soon as that announcement came overhead, and we wanted to know what the result was and what's happening and, and what the update was. So we want to know fast. And, and as journalists, that's a challenge because if we're putting out some misinformation just to meet those audience needs, uh, it can be a little bit tricky and difficult for us. And what's on the line for us? When we're putting news out there via social media, our credibility is on the line, and not just our credibility. And I think somebody mentioned this in one of the sessions before, too, the credibility of our news organization. When I'm 
you know, tweeting uh, for a news organization, I'm not just tweeting for Jennifer Cox, I'm, I'm representing that whole news organization. And so that's on the line when we are putting information out there via social media. There's that competitive edge, we have to be first, we have to be the ones to break that news. And of course there's human lives and emotions uh, that are at stake here. When we're putting out information, particularly on something that's a sensitive topic, we have to think about those things. So this is just one of the many examples that I share with my students to illustrate uh, how online journalism can be uh, tricky and why accuracy is so important. And this is, like I said, one example is the West uh, Virginia mine collapse in 2006. I'm sure a lot of you guys remember that. Uh, the mine collapse uh, trapped 13 miners and reports nationwide flooded in that 12 of them were safe and one had died. And then it was found out later that actually 12 had died and one had survived. And so that was a pretty big, pretty big shift there. There was a real miscommunication in the rush to break that news online and to put it out there to audiences. And I asked my students, okay, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is we go from joyous hugs and things like that to this, all right? And you've, you've now gotten people's hopes up and then you've shattered them. And that's a really, really dangerous thing that you're playing with there. So the activity that we do to illustrate the point of accuracy and why it's so needed and how difficult it can be to achieve is I split my class into two teams. We have the reporters and the writers. And we do this twice during the semester, so both uh, sides get the opportunity to experience the others. Uh, and I try to find an event that coincides with my class time. For this uh, pre previous semester, the event happened to be a job fair at the university. Uh, so they had to go to the job fair, uh, and it was just, my class period fell just before the job fair was starting. So they went as the vendors were setting up and as things were getting organized. And so the reporting team left the classroom with their smartphones, off they go, and they were out there reporting it. Uh, they had to conduct interviews with vendors, students, anyone else who was around. The organizer who I'd contacted beforehand knew and was there to help out and give student interviews as well, so that was great. Uh, and then they had to tweet their findings, including their attribution, direct quotes. We had already been through all the basics of what needs to go in journalism tweets prior to this. Uh, and then finally, they all had to use the common hashtag, SU Job Fair. I'm from Salisbury University, that's the SU. Then uh, for their participation credit that day, they had to do seven to 10 tweets during the job fair during that reporting period. Now back in the classroom, my writers slash editors were using Storify, and they had to produce an article only using the tweets that the other students, the reporters, were sending back. So they were relying on that information. And from that, they had to put together a Storify, a cohesive Storify that told the story of preparing for the job fair. Uh, it gave us a scene of what was going on over there. And they had to also write a summary lead that described what was happening and what the story was about. So that's what they did. And they had to publish the Storify by the end of class so they had an hour and 15 minutes. Well, probably closer to an hour because it took the students about 15 minutes to get over to the, the job fair and produce their first tweets. So for those of you guys who don't know, and I don't think I need to spend too much time on this because we've talked about Storify so many times at this conference before, um, it's used to gather different types of social media uh, activity across different platforms. So you can gather uh, you know, YouTube, you can gather Twitter, Facebook, all sorts of different ways uh, to pull social media that's actually close to your geographic area talking about uh, the things that the subjects that you want to talk about and pulls them into kind of an article like format and I tell my students it's a great way for them to diversify their sources to reach out to sources that otherwise they might not have known existed um, one of my favorite examples is when you have to do a man on the street kind of story like uh, hey beach season's coming up go talk to some people about how they're getting into shape you'd have to go stand on a street corner and find people and hope for the right person well, now using social media and tools like Storify, we can kind of uh, find some sources that we don't usually have. So here was the result. Here were just some samples of the tweets. We got lots of uh, specific examples, lots of twit pics. They weren't the best quality. We hadn't covered photo at that point yet. So, you know, bear with us there. Uh, but we have a lot of different uh, specific facts that students could tweet out. Um, this was the Storify, an example of the Storify that was produced, and, and they did a pretty good job with that. But the biggest issue was accuracy. We were getting things like this, 104 students at the job fair, 102 students at the job fair. Uh, 70 vendors, vendors, more than 70 vendors. So how do we deal about, with that? These were great teachable moments for us. And what we did was I told them, you have to look for other sources to confirm. So they had to go out beyond just what their reporters were putting out and see if anybody else was talking about these things. 
Uh, they could, I told them, you don't have time now, but you could and would in a, in a newsroom make calls to verify information, of course. And most importantly, if you're not sure, don't publish it. That's the bottom line, okay? Uh, afterwards, we had a great wrap up with reporters and I'm being given the wrap up sim signal as well. So I am going to end on that note. Uh, thank you so much. Please welcome to the stage, Andrea Hickerson from Rochester University of Technology. Also known as Rochester Institute of Technology. There we go. Um, thank you very much for coming today. It's been a great conference so far. And if you're like me, you might have heard a ton of great ideas. And it might even stress you out a little bit about what are you going to do with all this stuff and how are you going to put it in your curriculum. Um, I'm going to address a little bit of that in my talk today, which is about interdisciplinary collaboration, the pros and the cons. So I'm going to try to establish a little credibility with you and then pass on some lessons um, some good and some bad about what I've learned and tried to accomplish this at my university. Just to give you a little bit of background, Rochester Institute of Technology is exactly what it sounds like. It is a STEM school known for engineering degrees and known for computer science. Um, they started a journalism program in 2009 um, and some people thought, why are we doing this? Um, they had a strong photojournalism program, but I was the first faculty hired in journalism in 2009. Um, so our goal was to establish journalism at a tech school, but also to do that well, because we're a small program within a larger university, we knew that we would have to capitalize on the strengths of the other parts of the university, computing, um, also uh, science, computer science, business, and then also photography, graphic design, visual arts type programs. Um, so what we've tried to do in this context is try to create a niche with now we're up to three tenure track faculty um, about how can we really prepare our students for journalism. Um, the kind of the cool thing about starting a journalism program in 2009 at a tech program is once you explain it to people, they say, oh, I get it. You know, you've got the tools there that you might be able to use to pull off a pretty good de degree program. I'm happy to report that our enrollments are exceeding expectations, so that's looking pretty good for us. Um, so again, we've been trying to leverage the different strengths of the university, but I have my bullet point here, wherever it makes sense. And it's true that sometimes it doesn't make sense, and I, my first, I guess, piece of advice for interdisciplinary collaboration is sometimes it doesn't make sense, and you have to know what the strengths of your university are and the personalities involved to figure out what those parameters might be. Um, I've been involved in a couple of projects that have been interdisciplinary involving people from across the university. The first was a project called Rise Above the Crowd, which was funded by a grant from the Knight Foundation. Um, and what it was, is it was an experiment and live reporting that we put off at a campus event with 30,000 individuals at it. So what we did is, with my collaborator, Vic Ferrati, who's actually here too, um, we built with a team of students and a team of faculty from engineering, design, um, computer science, business, marketing, game design. We built this live reporting platform and then we had people report and as it would report, um, results or stories would show up on large screens that we had placed across campus. So we had this pretty good experiment going on um, back in 2011. So that was an interesting experience because it wasn't teaching per se, it was a project that we did in addition to what we would normally do in the classroom. Since then I've had two other opportunities to try interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, in spring of last year, I taught a seminar with a professor in the ITS department at RIT. His name is Professor Jeff Sonstein. And what we did is we had it, our, so not only were he and I from different disciplines, we may had I different students. Please? May I have your attention, please? Yes. I can honestly say I've had a captive audience, so thank you for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> on this team that I taught with a professor at the computing college, is we had students that were both from journalism and computing in there. We've got a strong open source movement in our computing college, so we thought that that might create a nice foundation where students would have a lot of commonality. So what we did is we divided teams and um, we gave them a certain technological parameters. So one team had to build a sports publication using HTML5. 
One had to use a content management system, and then the third group had to use um, cloud-based materials instead. So we to use this as an, um, an opportunity to discuss the, the limitations of the platforms and also the advantages of certain platforms. But also it was a big lesson in teamwork and how people negotiated working across different disciplines. Um, right now, what I'm doing is I'm running a digital journalism incubator class with my collaborator, Vic Parati, who's also here. And this is in the College of Business. And Dr. Parati is in Management Information Systems, which is a really nice asset because it's got that computing balance, but also entrepreneurship. So in this class, we have students from journalism, we have students from biomedical photography, we have students from sociology, from uh, marketing, um, business, game design, and computer science all in this class. Um, this time it's a little different though because we've given the students certain parameters where they all had to pitch their own business ideas. We've given them the topic, the topic of education because we wanted them to keep the civic um, community at the heart of what they were doing. And so each student pitched their own idea for an education, what we call the media platform or a publication. And they've kind of gra gravitated and formed three projects. One is basically an education fact check site. The other one is a digital art magazine. And the third one is a project collaboration platform for college students to work on interdisciplinary teams. If you're interested, uh, we're using that hashtag RITDJI. So you're welcome to eavesdrop and participate in that, see what we're up to. So this is my background and what have I learned from this. Um, number one is find the right person. If you want to collaborate interdisciplinary, sometimes it sounds good like, oh, we should really find someone in the computing college to teach web scraping. Yeah, that's a great idea, but it's more than that. You've got to find the right person and there's certain considerations that go into that. And one is personality. I've actually put that ahead of appropriate skill set because sometimes if you're willing to listen to each other and negotiate, you can figure out what that is. Um, secondly, I didn't really know what computer science was, to be honest with you, um, at first. And RIT is unique that we have a whole college of computing, so there is a computer science degree, an information technology degree in there, um, and others that I can't even think of right now, security systems. And so I had to do some homework to figure out what each one of those were and where my needs might be met and the needs of my students. And then also think about, you know, how are you going to work in the classroom together? Is it good to have a balance to contradict each other? Or are you going to come from this is the position of a journalist and this is the position of a computer science person? Or are you going to meet in the middle? Um, institutions. They are great, but they can be a big pain too, as I'm sure you know. Um, so interdisciplinary research, how are you going to make this sell? Um, you're essentially asking two people to teach one course. How can you convince your university that this is a great idea? Um, you have to answer certain questions that are going to come up. And one is, how will this count towards your faculty load? Will it count as a full class for both of you, a half class for both of you? What goes into it? One thing I've learned is that even though you're sharing the class, it's actually twice the work because you have to meet more with your collaborator to figure out what you need to do that day and get caught up on their skill set. Um, and then also this question, are your departments collaborating for the same reason is a really important question. Are they seeing this as an elective, like, oh, their students can learn something about journalism? Or are they going to bring the same seriousness to the class that your journalism students might bring or you might hope that they bring? And the other big challenge that we found is sustainability. Um, we are very fortunate that to run this course inaugurally, we have support from the Knight Foundation. Um, but what our academic units are going to do with this long term? How can we make a big case to, to justify having two faculty teach a single course um, over time is kind of an open question for us. Um, so what are the opportunities? One, and I think this is absolutely huge, is when I come here, I hear about all these great skill sets and things that I should have and that I just don't know how to do. And I don't have the time to do professional development. If you co-teach with someone, you can get professional development in the classroom. So instead of taking your own time, you can learn from that person and adapt to that skill set a little bit. It gets you off from having to know everything. Um, two more quick things. One is that it's also a really great basis for grant research and collaboration. Um, you can think of other, you can think of questions that might benefit both of you. And then thirdly, we talk to our students all the time about having diverse skill sets and being able to work with people from different backgrounds. And this is an opportunity for us as faculty to actually model that behavior, to say that, you know, hey, it's not always great all the time and have to negotiate things in front of the class. And I think in some ways, modeling that behavior might be the, one of the best things that we can do. So thank you for your attention.
please welcome Marcus Messner from Virginia Commonwealth University. Hold on just one second, folks. Don't count the time yet. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about um, integrating uh, iPad journalism into the curriculum. Wow, that looks uh, awful. So I hope not everything is displaying. I hope the, the next slides are, are going to be better. So what I did at uh, VCU in Richmond is uh, use um, iPads as reporting uh, devices to do uh, mobile reporting, breaking news reporting, um, with my students, so this is kind of how this looks like. Uh, we have uh, reporting kits with a tripod, with mics, um, but we also um, do on-the-spot reporting, as you can see down there. So this last fall, we covered the uh, gubernatorial um, election in Virginia. You might recognize Ken Cuccinelli there, Doug Wilder, um, uh, former governor, and then uh, the wild card uh, in the race, Robert Zaviz. And so, I started this class, uh, uh, which we call the uh, iPad Journal's uh, Mobile and Social Media Reporting Project uh, in 2012 as a special topics class uh, uh, for our journalism students. And I got uh, support internally from our Center for Teaching Excellence, but also through an external AJMC Knight Bridge grant um, to pull um, this project off. We're not in a PC lab. Uh, we're in a uh, conference room uh, with no computers, uh, just Wi-Fi and a projector. And so students really have to utilize uh, the mobile device to do all of their reporting. So after two times uh, teaching this as a special topics class, it has now become one of our capstone courses in the journalism program that students can choose from. And as I said, we covered the uh, gubernatorial election uh, this past fall. Everything is in the open, so uh, the, all the class uh, resources, materials, summaries of lectures are all on an open website. And when the class is in session, which is always in the fall, um, there will be a lot of uh, discussions on Twitter as well with the hashtag um, iPad journals. Uh, we have a media partner. Uh, I, I feel very uh, fortunate about this. We have a media partner, the local CBS affiliate in Richmond. is publishing all student work. Um, so uh, we're doing uh, breaking news reporting for them for the website um, on uh, political events, uh, but we're also doing uh, more long form uh, reporting for them as well. They have a page. Uh, for our project. You see we have a, uh, a logo that one of our students designed and uh, all of the stories um, get uh, published in a very timely manner um, on their website. Now how does that work? Uh, students buy a, a basic set of, uh, uh, of apps, so we're using iMovie, uh, which uh, most of you probably know, and then the students have to explore, it's actually a graded assignment, so they do it, uh, they have to explore apps and find their own toolkit um, that they are using. So not every student in the class is using the same apps. Uh, I let them develop their own multimedia toolkit. They're pitching their stories to me, and they're always connected with a producer at the TV station through a Facebook group. And we have access to that producer. It's actually a director for interactive media at that uh, CBS station, um, that during normal business hours, we always get an answer within five to 10 minutes. So uh, we can talk about uh, story pitches in class, uh, pitch them, from the iPad uh, in a Facebook group, and we know whether we can do the story within five to 10 minutes, and then students can go out and report that story. Uh, all stories are reported in, a, in Google Drive, so um, even when the class is not in session, I can always edit with students, uh, even as though we're in different locations. And then students always engage in Twitter discussions that they're reporting on Twitter first um, uh, when they do the reporting. Of course, we're using YouTube, Instagram more for, for breaking news. Um, so the reporting kit is really uh, when we do uh, uh, interviews that we plan and uh, we don't have to run somewhere, um, then we have a tripod, we have a mount, uh, we're miking up uh, uh, our interviewing subjects, and of course, uh, we're having the iPad and students can then uh, report and uh, edit, produce on the spot. Um, what this taught me, this project, is that the publication opportunity for the students, they're building their portfolio in that class, uh, is a really high motivator. I have access to the students uh, pretty much around the clock whenever I want, and I need to get in touch with them, edit with them, get, stu get the stories uh, in a publishable shape. I have access to them uh, at all times, and they have access to me at all times when I, when I want it. Of course, not, not during the night, 
Um, I, when I know that they're covering breaking news, uh, I can edit their stories from my kitchen table, um, which uh, political events are often at, at night. And, uh, and the work process is really students report, I edit, and then the uh, uh, producer at the TV station takes a final look. So the selling point for them is, of course, that they don't have to edit all of the stories. Um, I, do that, uh, I do that for them. Um, and so this is how that looks like. So for, we had interviews with all major contenders in the gubernatorial race. Uh, so for example, here, uh, a couple of days before the election, um, we got a one-on-one -on -one with Ken Cuccinelli, who of course, as you know, uh, didn't win the governor governorship. We did news curation. Uh, we also did uh, uh, breaking news. For example, students were covering the election parties and there, uh, there was a, a, a protest. Uh, uh, people were getting a little rowdy. They immediately picked up uh, uh, their iPad and they shot it on Instagram, shot it to the station. Within five minutes, it was on the station uh, website. So we published 30 multimedia stories uh, during this fall election. We had uh, students with iPads at every election party. Two were in Richmond, one was up here in Tyson's Corner, so they were with Terry McAuliffe, with Ken Cuccinelli, with uh, Robert Davies. We had uh, students reporting in the morning uh, of election day at all polling places, interviewing voters, and, and so all of these uh, stories uh, go up within, uh, on, on social media instantaneously, of course, but uh, within an hour or two, uh, students have to report the stories that they need to go up on the website. Um, of, uh, of our media partners. So they learn uh, to, to not only use mobile and social media, but they're also under immense pressure um, to perform and to um, report quality news uh, for our media partners. So I'll be teaching this class for the fourth time. So we've done this three times uh, so far. It's always in the fall. Um, and uh, this fall, we'll cover the uh, congressional midterm elections. Uh, do we also do local government reporting? It's kind of we're trying to establish that as a new niche because there's not that much local government reporting anymore. And I'm getting the ultimate time limit right now. If you're interested in anything about the project, I've put a post up on my personal website, uh, marcusmethner.com. You can see all the specs, what mic we use, what mount, what iPad, and uh, all of the platforms that we're using uh, for this project. Okay. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage Jeremy Kaplan from the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited. It's been a fantastic day so far for me. Um, I'm excited to talk about using games to inject a little bit of creativity into the classroom. And the slides and the digital handout and all the links that I'm referencing are in this document at bit.ly slash idea jamming if you're interested in following up on it later or following along as I go. And just a few quick points I'll make since the time is short. Um, first of all, quick game just to have a little bit of a moment of, of, um, of, of fun, hopefully. And then a couple reasons for why we actually want to do this, although it may seem intuitive. And then finally, some specific tools and resources for, for using in, in classroom and other contexts. So first of all, a quick game. I tweeted out a couple of, of different links for you to test out. This is really for you to see what it's like to be in the student kind of um, context. And um, first, I want you, though, to just look at this image up on the screen for a few moments, just for some kind of inspiration for the game that's coming up next. So some of those things may look familiar. Some may not look familiar. And. This is the link to the game. If you don't want to do it right now, you can come back to it later. Um, if you want to do it now, it just takes a, a couple minutes, because the idea is to be really kind of quick and think in a really sort of fast brainstorming kind of way, just kind of the, the first creative thing that comes to mind. The idea is to think to yourself, there should be a blank. What kind of tool for either creating or consuming journalism would be really cool to have? Could be something that's completely unfeasible or unrealistic but just something that would be useful or interesting or fun or something that you'd like to have. That's the idea behind this quick game. So uh, if, you take, if you want to take a moment later, if you want to take a moment now, I'll give you just sort of 10 seconds now, those of you who want to open that up and take a look at it.
I'll actually have some, some um, next generation chocolate tomorrow morning for the best idea that comes through to, to that uh, link. So hopefully that'll be some incentive for at least some of you. Um, so, okay, a couple of reasons on why we want to do this. Um, and again, it may seem obvious, but sometimes we need a reminder that a classroom should be more than just a one-way communication kind of place. And I think uh, in a lot of places, a lot of schools I've visited, there's still a lot of lecturing going on. And I think sometimes even just these small little injections of interactive exercises and games can change the dynamic and make things more fun. One of the things we're actually in the middle of doing right now at the CUNY J School is rethinking what actual furniture we use. And I know a lot of you have gone through that, and I'm very excited to rethink whether we can you know, move beyond just having tables and chairs in a traditional way. Um, so for one thing, it just breaks the routine. Um, whether you're working in a newsroom or whether you're working in a classroom, it just shakes things up a little bit, gets people up and looking away from their laptops. How many people have an issue or have had an issue at times with students getting distracted by Facebook, email, anything that, that's coming up in their screen? All of us, right? At least many of us, I assume, have that issue. I constantly face that, even with really engaged students, just because there's so much exciting stuff that's pulling us away. So how can we avoid that or how can we address that? We can't avoid it, I don't think, but one way we can address it is by having people fully engaged throughout the class as much as we can, meaning doing something, answering something, thinking about something, imagining something, playing something, um, hopefully to an end that's useful and, and, and serves a purpose for our teaching. It also can be a great source of ideas. So actually, a lot of times we've been playing these games um, either in a digital journalism class that I teach or in an entrepreneurial journalism class that I teach, and an idea will come up and people will say, hey, that's actually really something. And there have been a couple instances where people have pursued an actual story based on an idea that they came up with during a game. And actually, in a couple of instances, they've actually started to pursue a business idea. So at the Town Aid Center, where I teach at the Entrepreneurial Journalism Center, we've had more than 50 um, journalism projects come through that center over the past four years. And at least a couple of them, the seeds for at least a couple of them, came through a couple of the games that we play. It's also just fun. And I think people should think back on classes and think, wow, that was really fun. I really enjoyed that. OK, so some specific resources and, and tools. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, many of you may have used game, um, card games in your classes. Um, I've got a bunch of them here. If anyone's interested, later on in the conference, I have them all here with me. I'll show you them. You can um, try them out. Um, and I've listed them all also on that bit.ly slash idea jamming link. Um, but each of them comes with a kind of different approach, but the, the same general idea. You work with either one partner or two partners. I find that working in groups of two or three is optimal because you don't have that quiet person who's just kind of sitting by the side and you don't have that dominant person dominating the conversation when you just have a team of two or three. So we generally work in teams of two or three, and um, the, there, there are a variety of approaches. ThinkPack kind of gets you to twist an idea that you already have in a new direction. The AHA game, um, which is actually originally designed by Nick Diakopoulos, who's going to be speaking tonight, um, um, is basically about thinking about new kinds of technologies. So there's dozens and dozens of new kinds of technologies, and the game gets you to think about how is this going to change journalism. The ideal method cards, those of you who are familiar with design thinking, goes through the four stages of the design thinking process and uh, encourages students to try a particular method to address a particular issue or think of a new idea. Um, Creative Whack Pack gives you a scenario. It's, it's kind of colorful and gets you to rethink something in that way. And lastly, the Intuiti is one I actually got on Kickstarter. It's just an art-based one. So it's purely art. There's no words involved, but it gets you thinking um, beyond the way you've been normally thinking. One thing I've been trying to do is come up with some of my own games. This is a very much an alpha kind of project, but um, I'd love help if anyone's interested in working on this. Um, basically, the idea is, a, is uses a Google News randomizer to pull random live Google News stories and assigns a set of parameters and constraints. So for example, it might say there's a story about a shooting in Ohio today. Um, how would you do this if, you, if your constraint was doing, telling this in audio format and um, having only three hours to prepare? and having a particular audience in mind, and so on and so forth. And I've created it initially as a spreadsheet that you can copy and re, um, rejigger in your own way to set your own constraints and to use a different news randomizer if you want to. Um, but it doesn't have a very nice UI right now. So I, I'd love to work with anyone on, on that if anyone's interested. Um, lots of prompts and prototypes in that idea jamming doc. Um, you can explore those um, at your leisure. I think creating simple prototypes on paper of an idea, using just simple storyboards, simple app, kind of storyboard um, designs can be a lot of fun and really, really um, get students thinking in new ways. Um, and finally, just specific tips on how to do this effectively. I think doing 20-minute sprints is really great. Um, students' concentration, in my experience, lags after that period of time in many cases. It's important to clarify the purpose. Sometimes that may seem obvious, but sometimes students aren't really sure why they're doing something, whether it's just to generate a lot of ideas, whether they're actually trying to find an idea that they're going to use, and so forth. 
And then finally, debrief ratio of one to four I find to be really ideal so that if you're going to spend 20 minutes on, a, on an activity, on brainstorming or idea jamming, as I like to call it, activity, spend at least five discussing it afterwards. Don't just end class and everyone goes their separate way because then they don't solidify what, what their takeaways are. Um, spend five minutes thinking about it, discussing it, talking about a surprise or a technique that emerged from the conversation um, so that people come away with something that they can um, take with them. Um, there's more in that document. Um, bit.ly slash idea jamming. I'm out of time. One other thing I wanted to show you just as a technique for um, doing this in the classroom is a tool called Socrative. Not many people um, that, that I know, have, has anyone used this in the classroom, Socrative? Just a couple hands, so I think this might be useful to people. If you go to beta.socrative.com, that's I-V-E, I just tweeted it out too with the hashtag. Um, you get a nice screen like this. Students don't need to register. They don't need to do anything other than type in the room name. You can actually do this if you want to play along. You can type in Kaplan, which is my last name, which is the room number um, for this. And I can actually log in and see the responses in real time. So you can see how quick it is. I've already set up the question, so it's already in progress. If I hadn't set up the question, I could quickly choose any of these buttons and use a quick question's multiple choice or true false or an open-ended question or I could draw on a question set that it already created or a quiz that I already created. In this case, there's already a question in progress and there's already two answers in there. Good afternoon. May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? The situation has been clear. The situation has been clear. So I no longer have a captive audience, so I will step aside um, for the next speaker. Great, so you may have noticed there's some more answers coming in. If I wanted to, I could start a vote so that the students or the participants in this case would have a chance to vote on which they thought is the most useful. In this case, I'm asking what tool or takeaway today has been particularly useful for you. Um, I'll leave this open. If anyone wants to continue participating, um, I may share the most popular ones um, again tomorrow morning. Um, but this is, again, beta.socrative.com. Totally free, totally simple to use. You can learn it in five minutes. Your students don't need any accounts or anything. Um, highly recommend it, and um, would love to hear from anyone else in the document itself if there are other um, resources that you like or you'd like to share with me. Thank you. If anybody has any police theme suggestions, please tweet them at JIcon. Uh, please welcome to the stage, Mickey Harris from the University of Mississippi. Do you mind making the slide? Or do I need to do that? Yeah, we're coming up right now. Oh, I can do it. I thought I could. Good. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. I want to talk about teaching non-visual people how to tell, take visual photos or tell visual stories. Um, I want to quickly say when I first got out of undergraduate, I was a technology consultant where I spent most of my days in a cubicle coding, designing, working on projects for years where we then rolled out uh, technology solutions. And for me, I loved it when I started and I was 22 years old out of undergrad because I was learning a lot of technology skills. Um, but what I was lacking and did not get in the six years that I worked for that firm was that human connection, um, the connection to emotion to help motivate me in my work. And so I switched gears and entered the world of jo journalism. And I became a photojournalist specifically because that was when uh, digital cameras were, were coming out and popular. And so I was able to begin creating stories with the tools, the multimedia tools, whether it's a digital camera, an audio recorder or a video camera to tell multimedia stories. And so now as a professor at the University of Mississippi, we have a multimedia program where photojournalism is a required course, which we, means we get every journalism student in a photojournalism class. And the majority of the time, they're non-visual people. 
um, they also have a hard time connecting to people. They're comfortable at the desk learning some skills, but when it's time to go out and engage people, it's a challenge. So this is an exercise that I do. We talk about what is photojournalism. A great photojournalism image is a composition of strong, is a combination of strong composition, strong light, and a strong moment. And so we start the course off with talking about composition. And some great examples are using rule of thirds, seeing reflection, creating beautiful images. There is no story here, but they really look good. Seeing leading lines and capturing that. We have great images that have won awards, but again, there still is not a story here yet. And depth, using shallow depth of field, camera techniques. Most of our students do use smartphones to capture images. Um, and so we go from the composition into talking about light. Light is what tells a viewer where to look. If there's no light, there's no photo. And this is an actual photo that was turned in. I have no idea what it is. <laughs> but it's a good example of no light, no photo. And so after we teach how to use light and composition, that's when the story begins. And that's where we talk about capturing moments. And so when you're capturing a moment and you have limited time covering an event, you're anticipating a moment. And instead of documenting the visual verbs, you're documenting the reaction to those verbs. You're documenting the reaction to the action. And so a lot of students go to events and they're just covering what people are doing, not how they're responding or reacting. For the, so the first step in telling a storytelling image is to look for reaction. So when you don't have a lot of time, you're looking for moments like this. And this is an intro to photojournalism student with a smartphone who's going out there and capturing this for the first time. If you're capturing moments and you don't have the access to people, such as a podium or a panel, you're looking for that reaction to something being said that captures the emotion. So the emotion is typically ha happening within seconds during what could be a very long and boring uh, session where faces are not showing much expression. So you have to be patient. So when we talk about capturing emotion when there's limited access, it's looking for this reaction to something being said. All right, so the exercise we have is we then move into we have some time and you want to get access. You want to get up out of that seat, let's leave the classroom and let's start to figure out what to do. So I first ask, what false first impression do people have of you? And they're always negative. People raise their hands and they say all these words. These are all words from students. And um, they say, this is not me, but this is what people think of me when they first meet me. And so the second question I ask in this exercise is, what do people who know you well, what do they say about you? What do they know about you? And that's when the positive starts to come out. And so people go from these negative words of dumb, clown, naive, fake, stupid, to words like determined, friendly, funny, nurturing, caring. And so the next question is, how long does it take for somebody to go from that false first impression of you to the real you? And it could be seconds, it could be minutes, it could be days, weeks, years. So the exercise we have is I say, take that time. So if it's for you, five minutes, go out and find somebody and spend five minutes to get to know that person. So their first step is understand the time it takes to establish access and get to know somebody. How do you go from that false impression to the real impression of somebody? When you find that person to document, engage that person for that amount of time. Spend at least some time getting to know somebody. And as you do that, you'll start thinking and seeing who that person is. And you'll come up with this list of words to describe that person. And it could be caring, it could be funny. Maybe it is some nasty word that you would, it would cover somebody, but you're, you're realizing who this person is because you spent some time. And so with the assignment then, they observe, anticipate and start capturing those words. So if you spend some time with somebody, you then get to know who they are and can document that and capture that emotion. So then we see photos like this, friendly, supportive, helpful, playful, faithful. Key takeaways, if you don't have any time, 
Go beyond the visual verbs and start looking for reaction to action. But if you do have time, know that you can get access to somebody's life, get to know them, engage them, and start capturing those words that describe who they are. And that helps to tell a story. Then spend even more time and get to know them even more. Um, going back to the beginning, the best visuals are those that are a combination of strong composition, light, and moment. And the emotion that you can sense and document in a person is what connects viewers to those images. So thank you. Please welcome to the stage Donica Mensing from the University of Nevada, Reno. <laughs> okay, so my first caveat is that I haven't tweaked this presentation for at least six hours. It's horribly out of date. <laughs> I have learned so much from the other presenters that I have lots of things that I would like to change. So, here we go. So we are all here because we love news and we love journalism and we want our students to love the news and so we make them take quizzes so that they will love the news too. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? It doesn't work very well. So I've been thinking about how can I engage my beginning students to love the news the way I love the news and thinking about we have lots of tools now. We heard a session just a little while ago about all the curation aggregation tools um, that students can use. We also have a lot more things we're trying to teach students. So thinking about the beginning student has to have a lot of dynamic concerns, interests, goals from the very get-go. So they're thinking very early on about how do I find and evaluate local news? I don't just turn on the local TV station. There's so many sources. How do I find them? How do I evaluate them? How do I choose what I'm going to pay attention to myself? How do I create a news product that will actually engage an audience? And then how do I share it? These are all concepts that we need to be building in very early on in the curriculum. So, the thing that I have been experimenting with is how do you teach students to remix the news? We spend a lot of time in journalism school crafting original content, which is really, really important. But there is also now the need to curate content, to remix it, to be a DJ, as some people have been talking about. So there are many, many tools now that you can use for giving students an opportunity to remix news early on. It gets them familiar with different kinds of news, what it looks like. You expand the universe, as Amy Webb, Amy Webb was talking about this morning. So <clears throat> we've heard about Storify a little while ago. Um, there's Sponge, Ziga. I just heard about Trove, Newspeg. There's lots of tools. But I want to talk today about Ziga. So it's a very, very fun interactive media tool. It's basically news by GIF with music. right? Um, and it was created by Matter, which is a San Francisco-based accelerator funded by KQED, Public Radio in San Francisco, the Knight Foundation, and PRX. Really, really interesting projects coming out of this accelerator. So Ziga is one of them, if you haven't run across it. This is what the interface looks like. I didn't spend any time teaching my students how to use this. I just said, go to this URL and experiment. So it's a drag and drop cloud-based tool so that you can mix images, social media, and sound and GIFs into a storytelling tool, a story. Lots of different organizations have been experimenting with it. Let's see if I can get this to work. This is one that NPR did for the 50-year anniversary of the March on Washington, where they GIFified Contact sheets. Oh man, that was that was a day. 
that was that was some day. It was a hot, humid summer day in Washington, even at 6 a.m. It was. It was a stressful day. We were out there early that morning, yeah. still getting set up with the signs and everything. And I don't know, we had put together maybe 10,000 or more signs. When you first hit the street, so to speak, there wasn't much activity. But it was still, you know, quite early in the morning. I would say maybe around 9 o'clock or maybe a little earlier than uh, people started to show up. The for the so the user the drives has been the case to of the, the slide. Cross tent, which is to my left. 11 o'clock. By the time the sun came up, we were almost out of sight. You know, everybody was standing. They didn't have chairs. <laughs> Gives you a little sense of the uh, of what it might look like. I can show you more examples, but it would probably take up too much of the time. So, <clears throat> oops. So this was the assignment that I gave the students. Create an engaging news product that would take one or two minutes to watch. Include three to five noteworthy local news stories. I was really trying to get the, to think about what's happening in our local community that you think other students would be interested in. You could add entertainment, celebrity, news, sports, but at least three to five local stories. And focus on students as your target audience Publish it on deadline and share it on social media. So Zigas are very, very shareable. They run, they can be embedded on just about any platform. You can see you've got to sometimes play with them in the browser. But they're very, very um, shareable. So the students created a Ziga every day for the last month of last semester just as an experiment. They're not great. But they loved doing it. So I have ideas about how to improve the assignment um, <clears throat> for next semester. If we can maybe watch. This is a pretty typical one. Um, so they made a product called Reno Buzz. Came out every day. So because all of the media is in the cloud, Ziga creates the um, attribution at the bottom of each slide so you know where it came from. You can upload your own photographs, but then they're public at that point. Um, how am I doing on time? So I'm going to wrap it up now. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I'll post the, I have posted on SlideShare, I'll tweet out the link so if you want to see the rest of it, but that's how you might engage students with news. Is it on? There you go. Up next, Katie Culver from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. I'm going to talk about theory. I mean it. Get off Facebook. It's something that's really important for you. What I'm going to try to talk to you guys about um, is how you can take a skills-based approach to theory courses 
get rid of what you have traditionally done and make them wholly awesomer. Okay, so, oh, this got all weird. Okay, <laughs> it went from keynote to PowerPoint, it got really strange. Okay, so I had this horrible problem um, a few years ago. I was teaching a, um, an advanced course in um, digital media law and ethics. Great class, great students, Mother's Day weekend. I found myself sentenced to grading 25, 25 page research papers. And I have fantastic students, but there's no way around it. These stunk. And I felt really bad in two ways. One, I had pointed this canon of drudgery directly in my own face. I did it to myself. And two, the papers showed me that I had not connected with, him, with them. And that was really painful to me. They had not ha had the capstone research experience that I wanted them to have. So, just like how do you solve a problem like Maria, I had to solve the problem of their research. And at the time, I was doing some um, work looking at some ed education literature, which is all buzzword loaded, and one of the buzz phrases was backward design. And I was like, and, but then when I began to think about it, I thought this might actually be the solution to my problem. Backward design, for those of you who don't know it, you kind of do it intuitively, um, but it means start with the end. Start with the things that you, the competencies that you want your students to have at the end and work your way backwards down into assignments that will help them achieve that. So at Wisconsin, on the highest end level, we have these things that they call the ELOs. Again, buzzword alert. I associate that with the Electric Light Orchestra. They would like me to establish, to, um, to apply it to our essential learning outcomes. So one, they want our students to, whoa, <laughs> engage, I'm sorry, they're a little, <laughs> that's not how it went when I was practicing it. Okay, we want our students to engage with big questions. What are the key issues that they, they need to be dealing with in their world? They should get progressively more challenging problems over the course of a semester, over classes through a curriculum, and throughout their years at the university. We want them to develop a sense of personal and social responsibility, and we want their learning to be integrative so that they're not having these little islands of learning in individual classes, but instead, pulling things together more cohesively. So, <laughs> this, I, got, I swear to God, those of you, you design people, Mickey is like, what did she think? This was beautifully designed before. Okay, so I said, what can I do to achieve those in this class? And I said, maybe I should get away from this pure text-based approach to research and instead do these digital media assignments for this research project. So I said, what do I want the, this assignment? I'm okay. Okay, so what, what do I want this assignment to achieve? So what are the key objectives for the assignment? Um, I wanted them to have a really narrow focus, not to be doing this broad brush across all um, digital media law and ethics, but look at something really, really specific. That's okay. I didn't mean to make you run up here. It is, oh. If you could show Julie Andrews again, I can just click through it. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, here we go. There she is. See Julie? There she is. Oh. Oh, see, isn't that pretty? And there's the yellow again. You're not, I, I get that time backed up. I really do. You are the cutest little timer in the world. Okay, so there are my essential learning outcomes, remember? Okay. All right. So with these digital media assignments, I wanted them to learn the process of research. And that, I think, if I go back to my couch on that horrible Mother's Day weekend, that's what was most broken to me. That it was clear in these papers that I had, not, I had made assumptions about what they were actually able to accomplish in research and I needed to fix that. I wanted them to explore a specific question in depth, as I mentioned, apply the theories that we had been talking about. I tried to make those tangible throughout the semester, but I was testing whether they could apply them. And then I wanted them to share their findings publicly. What they learned shouldn't end on my couch. They should be able to share it with the world. So I designed the assignment to say, give me your narrow focus. What is your specific question? By the way, this is a group assignment, and I really found that they learned a lot from participating with each other. So small groups of four or five. Then what are your research questions? What literature are you going to review to inform this? Primary sources were required. They had to do original, in-depth, qualitative interviews, or they had to do surveys. <laughs> and then, what is your public-facing digital hub with the added elements um, that will make this not just text-based? <laughs> Did I get too far from it? 
I'd like to say this never happens in my classes, but it does all the freaking time. Okay, all right, so another buzz phrase, supportive scaffolding, also from the literature in backwards design, that if you really are trying to build this step toward these ultimate objectives that you're trying to achieve, it's not just setting up the objectives, it's meeting the students at different mile markers across the semester and giving them that support. If they're climbing, if they're climbing this giant skyscraper to wash the windows at the top and see what they find inside, you've got to be there surrounding them. You're the scaffolding that holds them up when they're about to fall. So in my class, we did this with these individual mile markers. So we, I just created a Google Drive for the research project and each group would come in, put in their research questions for the week. I would go in and comment. Sometimes we would do an open chat where they could ask about my comments. We could go back and forth. We did this at each of these phases um, during, this, during the semester, and this was a 14-week project that they were working on, capped by lightning presentations. Why? Because I learned so much the last time I came to Journalism Interactive from these seven-minute presentations. It, was, it blew my mind, and I, I hope you're having the same experience. Um, so this is just one example. One of my groups did um, a look at the law and ethics of Facebook facial recognition technology. So they had um, a hub that introduced it. They, they did screen capture video of themselves walking through their own Facebook feeds and exploring the implications of um, facial recognition technology for them and the people that they're connected with on Facebook. They pulled together storifies of traditional media and social media conversations about this technology. What was interesting here, when they did the storifies, they went back and, and changed one research question to deal with the idea of how this was being challenged and contested in social media spaces. They used other people's videos to both explain the technology and talk about creeping, as they called it. And then they did text analysis um, of the legal and ethical implications. Throughout this, the biggest takeaway for me was that I had to do ongoing assessment of how the project was working for them. This wasn't just go off and do all your own research and do something fancy and digital. It was throughout each phase, asking them questions about what they were learning, what problems I wasn't seeing. So for instance, um, doing a survey about how um, their groups were progressing and how that um, was feeling for them. So did they learn? Yes, overall, <laughs> that quote was actually really positive, but I skipped right by it. Did they learn? Yes. They reported that it was positive. It's, you know, usually that's the evaluation that you would skip over. Um, but if you want to try to remix this, if you want to try to do something like it, the full set of materials is at that URL. It stopped clicking. Part of the way through. Please welcome to the stage Andrew Matrenga from the University of Denver. Really random the way he says that. I love it. Thanks for that. Oh, can I edit this? Sweet. Oh, I can't edit it. Well, my name doesn't have an N. That's my fact check on that. Um, so if you are on Twitter, it's just Andrew Matranga, my name. Um, but I'm going to talk. I need the thing. I'm going to talk a little bit about Google Plus. Um, how many folks use Gmail? Nice. About a third of you. How many folks use Google Drive? A lot more of you, that's great. How many folks use Google Plus? Nah, not the virtual crickets I expected. Um, <laughs> and that's kind of the basic uh, premise um, of my entire sort of quarter that I'm working on at DU and this sort of breakdown of in the classroom and as the classroom. And um, we'll get into a little bit of that um, as we go. So why Google Plus? Um, because, well, all of these things, I'll get into each one of these bullets as we go. Uh, the numbers, building it out in the classroom as the classroom, and then the work in progress. And I'll be honest with you guys, it's definitely a work in progress um, because the students are receptive to it, and, and we'll get into that as well. Um, why Google Plus? Because nobody is there. Um, because they're not using it, right? So it's, it's not Facebook, right? They, so if they're in class, they can't like mess around and chat and message because they don't know how to use it really right off the bat. And I say they, and that's a generalization. <laughs> Well, they don't. I mean, and, and then because Google is the internet, because it's not Blackboard, and as a validation, um, the student uh, newspaper that I'm the faculty advisor for just wrote an article, news to me, that we're getting rid of Blackboard and going to Canvas. So I was like, this is great. I love using Google Drive and Google+. It's mobile. It's really friendly. Uh, for me, far more friendly than Blackboard. I live and run my business through Google. Um, the communication side, uh, there's a lot of internal communication across the entire Google platform, from Plus to Drive to Gmail. 
Uh, social SEO, of course, everything that we do on Google Plus is our digital footprint and is big there. And then the personal brand, that arrow goes to a little tool that I have in my Gmail called Reportive. I don't know if folks are using that or not, but if someone sends me an email, it automatically pings all of their social profile, and I don't even have to Google them, right? And, and usually I do a show of fans, who's Google their instructor before class? Not very many. I'm like, that's too bad. I'm really good on the internet. Um, and so are they, perhaps, right? But the personal brand is really important from profile to everything else that gets built out. And that's kind of what I go into when I start talking about the course to them. But there's a lot of data behind Google+, and um, you can check those stats. But I, something I probably tell them every time is that YouTube is the world's second largest search engine. So as multimedia producers, it's really important to leverage that channel. Um, so. Uh, building the community page, uh, if you've been on Google Plus recently, um, they've sort of, kind of moved things a lot around a little bit, but all the links, it's pretty um, blurry, but all my links, my sy syllabus, everything is in the far uh, right about this, and you know, they'll be like, I, I can't find the syllabus. I'm like, it's live on the internet. Go on the internet. <laughs> um, all the links are there, all the resources are there. I pull tons of, of different tutorials and everything from the web and put them up there. The categories I, I organize um, on the left side, I use specific categories or the hashtag as Google uses them um, as well to organize the discussion so I can follow what they're doing. This is virtual participation. You know, oh, I have to tweet for class? Oh, I have to post for Google Plus? Of course you do, and that's the point. And then there's really great discussion that goes on while we're in class actually doing it when I'm teaching them, but then when they leave class as well. And, and it's really interesting to see the, the dynamic and the breakdown of who actually is leveraging the platform over the 10-week the quarter because those folks typically just do better in the class because they're engaging in a way that, um, that I, I can't even expect sometimes because everyone comes to social media with their own, their own you know, preconceptions and, and utilizes it in their own way. Um, but for me, again, the whole point is to get them on Google and understanding that everything that they do on Google is gonna show up when someone looks for them for a job, right? It's building that personal brand. That's really important to me um, and for them because we need to be educating them as social media professionals. Um, the goal for me is to just leverage Drive completely, and that's going from Google News as news.google.com, day one, everyone. You should always know what's going on in the news, even if you're just reading me the headlines. You should know that breaking news is happening. So news.google, great, perfect. You can customize it. There's all sorts of great elements to that. Then I, I do a Drive tutorial and docs, and, and all of you are using Drive, or those who do. Um, many of my students do, um, but it's always interesting to teach them the exact workflow naming conventions because then everything filters to me. I have filters in my Gmail, I have filters in my Drive, and I'm dumping everything in so that I can grade as we go. Um, and then I get to teach them Google Sheets, um, which I love fusion tables. I'm a cartographer, so I love making maps. So I get to teach them data journalism straight from Google Drive. No fancy tools. There's some plugins that you can do for Sheets, or they're known as add-ons now. Um, and all these great tools that we learned today are great, but all this stuff is free, super simple, streamlined platform, uniform user interface, and then we'll do slides and all those other tools, and then we dump everything ultimately into the class blog, and I'm getting that, this quarter up to speed on that. Um, and I like using Blogger because it's free, WordPress is great of course, but I'm trying to just do you know, better living through Google, or better teaching through Google, I guess. Um, and that's what the Google Now thing kind of plays into as well. We've heard a lot about that today, which is terrific. Um, the actual as the classroom um, is, for instance, a good friend of mine, Matt Villano, travel writer, um, I had him do a hangout, right? These hangouts, especially hangouts on air, are really useful, I find. And it's, it's nice for me to break down that barrier for them to show them that, you know, it's not okay just to interview someone by email or even by phone anymore. You can actually interview someone by hangout. And that's really a useful tool for a budding journalist to have that human contact. You can see how they respond. You can have a better rapport through Hangouts. And, and I think especially the Hangouts on air and uh, um, the live sort of YouTube app that lives on iPad um, is really, really useful. Um, and then, of course, private office hours and meetings. I use Hangouts, uh, and I leverage Hangouts that way. I'll, I'm not going to have class on Monday because I'm going to still be on the road. So I'm going to meet up with them and just either chat or if they're you know, there's always tech issues of plugging in their webcams for whatever, but um, in any event, that's how I, I leverage the Hangout, um, and that's a great one-to-one -one or one-to-many, depending on, on the, um, the purpose. In this case, well, he was giving a guest lecture on blogging, so that was pretty terrific. Um, the work in progress, um, integrating Google calendars. I figured out a way to just take spreadsheets and formatting specifically for 
the way Google calendars work. So I use Google Sheets and I can just have five columns, type everything in, and then import it into Google calendars. There's an import function on the, on the bottom left there. So that way I could just plan my whole quarter out and upload a calendar and they can see the calendar and there's no, well, when does it do? Look at the calendar, it's on the website. Um, quantifying the engagement, that's something that I still have to figure out a little bit. I've been doing this for two quarters and I want to figure out how I scale. You know, just posting things might not be enough, right? I want to figure out more with forms for quizzes and tests just to have that um, in the system for me and I have to build out a lot of that content. And then evolving the project. Is this working? You know, I've done this for two quarters. Um, I think in general it's, it's, it's successful because it's something different for them and at least I'm op exposing them to the notion that everything you do on Google matters, right? And that's how people are going to find you. Um, and there will not be a Q&A, obviously, but um, I will say with the one caveat is working with Drive is really important to make sure that your permissions and your sharing are all synced up and, and not having sort of any file problems. So um, that's something that uh, I'm working on as well and, and educating them. So in general, um, the takeaways for me um, for this sort of progress process has mostly been one-on-one -on -one teaching with them and then scaling it out. Thanks. Please welcome to the stage Serena Carpenter from Michigan State University. Hi, everyone. I'm the last one, so we're almost done. Um, so. I um, am fascinated with storytelling, and so, but how stories are formed and followed today is different. So what does that mean about journalism education? What I did this semester in my multimedia reporting class is I actually did a transmedia experiment. Transmedia, huh? So what is transmedia? It stems from the entertainment industry, and Henry Jenkins coined the term in 2003, and essentially it means across media. And so what this essentially means is fan-driven content that is broken out across platforms, i.e. platforms, Reddit, YouTube, such things like that. But what it teaches students to do is to think about communication behaviors, communication culture, and preferences on all of these different platforms and developing content based on those particular uh, preferences. So how to teach transmedia storytelling? Well, use a story that people are familiar with, that they're comfortable with, that takes them back to their childhood. And so I use Three Little Pigs and the Wolf. And so we know this story, we do, but if we look at the story from a different perspective or we look at it from this particular perspective. So I had them try to kind of pitch different story ideas that they could do, do this kind of transmedia-esque approach. And so they would pitch something like, um, I will do a story on the antisocial tendencies of the wolf and how he got to where he was today. But that's not enough, okay? So that's not enough if you're gonna teach transmedia. So I said, well, I want you to think about where you would tell that story, on what particular platform, and how would you frame the content based on your understanding of users on that particular platform and what they're attracted to. So then we could do a blog, uh, you know, the, the, one of the little pigs is paranoid that there's this dark lurking figure, or one other pig could do a YouTube cooking channel and have something like parsnips or a stewed wolf surprise or something to that effect. And so they would have this nice little cooking channel. Um, so I'm gonna, I show examples of this because this really does bend their mind, okay, it really does. And so one of the examples I show is the uh, culture of coffee, which basically looks at the roots of coffee. And so this is a Tumblr site, um, this is a website, and then she actually created actual coffee table books based on this particular project. Um, and so another transmedia ask philosophy is this idea that this is a multiple, multiple media creator world. So what does that essentially mean? That means we need to think about actually using other people's content, of course, asking their permission and, and actually citing it. So why not create an assignment where you have to cite local people's content and, and create a story based on your inspiration of content they created and, and partner it together? Or why not have one of my students actually partner with one of your students and they kind of cover the issue of rural America or homelessness in their particular city. And so these are things that we can work on together because a lot of us aren't kind of teaching these sort of things. And so this is something that I want to encourage. An example of this is actually 18 days in Egypt. What these two individuals did is they went to, the, to Egypt and what happened was they wanted to shoot a documentary but 
everybody was shooting a documentary there. So they decided to say, let's look at this slightly differently. And so what they did is they requested uh, social media content, content from people who were experiencing it for first hand. They all had cell phones. They were sharing this information online. And they actually created a collaborative documentary based on these 18 days in Egypt and using other people's content. And so these are things that I, I'd like to see us start teaching. So in this particular class, um, one of the things Min posed, there's a recent, uh, recent study that was talking about this. Essentially, you know, what they do is that they have to build relationships with people in the community to order to get funding for uh, story topics or issues that, are, that the community face. So this idea of cultivating relationships in the community is something that I, I wanted to teach my students. So I had them partner with a local nonprofit and to cover an issue that they felt passionate about. So what was great about this assignment, though, was they were not only accountable to me, but they were accountable to the nonprofit. And so this kind of was this inspirational type of thing. And I, I really was pleased with this particular project. Um, experience first, Steve Jobs said, the reason, one of the reasons for his success was basically um, that he thought about experience first. And so what happens is I'll ask my students, they'll post content, I said, you know, would that make you passionate about that issue? Would you share that particular uh, topic? Was, was it something that, you know, what do you feel about this content? And a lot of times they don't feel, which is kind of sad to me. But um, so what I wanted to do was try, I tried this experiment. Um, and what it was is I assigned a visual, a visual platform assignment. And what they had to do was they had to create visual content for one platform based on some overall communication goal or some overall focus. So it had to be focused. It hadn't be just throwing up pictures, random pictures. And so this is the kind of stuff I have to fight media uh, routines that we teach in J schools. And those routines are a lot of times is, you know, what's a caption? The caption is not the same across all different platforms, right? So what, is, what would be something that would emotionally tap into me? So what was something that would actually engage me? And so what I got was these kind of dense captions. And visual communication, if you can, read books about visual communication because it's, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. But you can see this particular fo this photo here. It's the nice earshot, black and white, someone answering the phone. Would that make me care about Alzheimer's and the organization and make me want to have volunteer for that particular organization? So how do we connect our content to the public? So if we look at basic visual communication principles, one of the things is, is basically, oh, one of the things is, is that faces, smiles, hashtags, and you know, some nice emotional quotes, because those are the things that people are going to share rather than this kind of detached, detensed, uh, uh, detached content. So what do I mean by serialize your thinking? Another transmedia type approach is this idea that I wanted them to create a YouTube channel. But on this channel, I wanted them to create a, a serial. And so I said, what, what happens in journalism is we often create what's called episodic content. And so we have this issue, we have this issue, we have this issue, but we're not developing a loyal following. I said, I want you to create content. I want it to be something that I would want to tune into your specific channel every single week. What would make me want to come back? And so if we think about YouTube channel and what would make me want to come back, so, some, so uh, some example series was basically a series for Alzheimer's caregivers and a, and a support system and trying to come up with videos like that. One was basically how to acclimate to a community if English is not your native language. Now, this is YouTube. You, what works well on YouTube? So these are educational videos. A typical web, YouTube web series is about you know, 10 videos. But you, know, you can assign three videos just because I want them to start thinking differently. Um, and that was really hard for them to, because they would pitch something like an overview of an organization or going to an event. So uh, I just felt like I had to end with a Harry Potter quote. Um, but anyway, so what do I want to, what I want you all to teach and what I try to practice is that I believe content, the way we create it should enable communication. So what are we doing to encourage communication and, 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 and what, to what extent is our content doing that? And also I think it's important to develop teach our students to de uh, develop a collaborative literacy in order to develop narratives across platforms and to encourage people to actually contribute to those narratives on all those different platforms. Um, and I, I obviously didn't promote myself very well, but uh, the stuff is on my website, serenacarpenter.com, if you're interested in learning more. That's it. <laughs>
Shaw. Oh, okay, I'm live. Thank you, thank you. I have a confession to make. This is a safe space, right? Yeah? Okay. We heard 11 really great ideas, and there are only 16 weeks in a semester. So what we're going to do now, uh, Deb, if you want to come up and join us. No? Oh, okay, she doesn't want to come up and join us. But we've uh, asked our Teachathon presenters to come back up for a few minutes of Q&A, and then we'll have the reception where I'm sure they'll be glad to answer qu any questions that you have. So I'm going to come around the room with the microphone just because we are recording this, so we'll want to do that, and direct your question to any or all of the panelists, and anybody or all of you who want to answer, use that mic right there, okay? Anybody have a question? Oh, come on, you shy group. <laughs> Deb's got a question. Ringer. I know if Ziga has um, analytics, does it give you information on how many people are accessing the things your students are creating? Yes, you get just raw numbers for how many have used uh, Ziga. <laughs> I have stepped to the podium. <laughs> Ziga has raw numbers for how many have viewed. I have not investigated metrics better than that. So. Another question over here? Sorry, Leslie. To the gentleman from Denver, I'm sorry if I missed it, but the title of your class that does all this Google, Google platform stuff? Step to the podium. Um, it, it's the online and visual journalism class. It's called online and visual journalism, but I mean, I teach data, I teach video, I teach all of the things that have been talked about today. Um, and then for the news writing reporting class, I just use Twitter as that, as that module. Hi, uh, this is for Jennifer. Um, not to open a can of worms before happy hour, but do you talk about retweeting at all and the ethics of retweeting? So the question was, talk about the, the ethics of retweeting. Yeah, um, and that's, uh, that's actually something that we did address in the class, and um, I'm happy to talk about it at happy hour. Uh, but um, yeah, it, there are certain, certainly you have to be responsible for that information. Um, and so we talked about how much you should rely on that information and making sure that you credit your sources, uh, in particular when you're retweeting information, making it clear that this is not first person reporting in a lot of cases. For our class activity, it wasn't as big of a deal because it was they were to be working within the same newsroom, uh, so to speak. But we did talk about that uh, beforehand and how you can't just um, just take something off of somebody else's Twitter feed that you don't know and slap it on your own uh, post and call it fact. Uh, and that, that is a really big concern in the field for sure. Is that enough for now? <laughs> the modified tweet, yes. Yes, what would you like me to address about it? <laughs> um, it, it? Well, the modified tweet, uh, we didn't really use it much in the class because the students just had to pull the, the stuff as is into uh, into the storefy. Um, but for the modified tweeting, um, it actually helps when you're use it. We use it somewhat in the class when we're um, answering questions, when we're using social media as kind of an interactive thing. So as to say, um, you know, uh, this person said this or asked this, and so I'm, I'm commenting on that. And, and so we use it kind of to add that commentary or to clarify something. Um, but we don't, we don't really use it in this lesson, per se. So for everybody, what are some of the ideas for the classroom you've gotten from your students? Don't all rush up to the podium. And I'm so glad, because this is the thing I had to cut when she was orchestrating me off the Academy Awards. So one that I got um, on this project was the idea of using um, digital, uh, using um, narrated screen capture for the students to experience and capture something that they've experienced online. So just to illustrate that with an example, I had one group that was doing um, law and ethics and mommy bloggers, and one of their questions was about whether this puts their kids at risk, the mommy bloggers' kids at risk. And so they did a narrated screen capture where they, and they set a timer on the screen where they tried to get from a, a mommy blogger who used a pseudonym and used pseudonyms for her kids to the kids' actual identities. And it took them like between a minute and a minute and a half to get from the mommy bloggers page through some just standard searching um, to the, the school that the kids were enrolled in and a Google Street View of the school. And it was just stunning to me. So a lot of the kids used that kind of, in the subsequent semester, used that where they were trying to experience their issue online and record that experience as they were going through. It was really novel. I have a 
quick one. Um, students were very excited when we did a field trip a couple of years ago and asked if we could do that more often. And so we have instituted for the entrepreneurial program, we have um, weekly startup trips. So we visited Facebook and Twitter and also places like, like um, New York Times and, and Reuters, but um, every week it's a different place. And it's been a great way to get out of the classroom and get them thinking about what new newsrooms are doing, what new tech companies are doing, how tech can play into journalism. So we also visit BuzzFeed and Rebel Mouse and all kinds of cool new places. And that was largely a student suggestion. Uh, the students asked me how to make a GIF, and I said, I, I don't know. <laughs> you learn, and you teach the rest of the class. So two women did, and they did a tutorial. They showed it to the class, and then the rest of the students were able to use it. I learned how to be a nicer editor. I have two related questions. Uh, I guess Jazzy and Serena, I don't remember your name, Jazz, Jamming, Jazzy guy. Um, yeah, I'd like to, and one for Serena, uh, and both of you can answer. How, if you take the a student who's really trying and you take your worst student and your best student, I'd like to know about how far you get them in this process. So that's also related to how is your class situated in the curriculum? Do they come to you at zero? Do they come to you with something? So where are you situated? And how far do you think you take the worst and the best? So Jazz Jammin and Serena, would you answer that? Oh, man. All right. <laughs> um, so I, I, I've learned to, to not assume that, that all my students have the, the baseline skills that they need to, to create content. And I'm aware of that. and I. I I teach from that particular approach, and it's kind of a very, you know, just I go with the flow and whatever they need, I try to make that happen. Um, but I think as far as what do I do with the, the best students, um, the best students, you know, I, I find that sometimes in the classroom we have these amazing students, and I encourage them to be teachers to others because I think it's very empowering, and they feel like they're contributing to the overall class. Um, my my worst students. I'm trying to think. You know, I, I I don't know. I think that you know the worst student to me is one who doesn't show up. So I don't really know what to do about that particular one. Um, but um, I I just I don't know. What do I do with my worst? I try to basically to have my other students inspire my other student to do a good job because I might not really reach that student and I might not be doing a good job. But that's what I do, I guess. Sorry. So um, I would say I'm dealing with only grad students, so it's different from some people here. Um, I do believe, though, in Carol Dwork's idea of the, the mindset book, that those, and those of you who may know that, the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. So there are a lot of people, a lot of students that I encounter, including mid-career professionals, who say, you know, I'm not really good at the tech stuff, or I'm not really a visual person, or I'm not really good with numbers. Those are three things I hear a lot from people. And then we start working on something, and we try to take a different perspective, and they actually do really well with it. They're really creative about it, and they may not think that they're good at it, but they actually do have a natural capability towards it. They just didn't realize it. So a lot of people have a fixed mindset coming in thinking they can't do something, and then if you explore and are flexible with them and approach it in different ways, they often will adopt that growth mindset, wow, I actually, this is kind of fun, or this is kind of interesting. So I have found with a lot of people, they can do a lot more than they think they can, or that than I think they can. It just requires thinking about their skills and strengths in different ways, and helping them see what they can do and, and get excited about what they can do, rather than focusing on what they can't do. Can I go back, and I, after I grab my iPad, I can tell you, I've, I've got a couple of suggestions from students and this is a group of iPad junkies or, or app junkies. Uh, one of them that, that the students recommended that, that worked out very well, it's called GroupMe, and, and it allows you to create small groups of students, small groups, and we did that as we were developing uh, a responsive website. It worked very well with development and being able to go back to text back and forth with students. Uh, I have a, a graduate assistant who swears by an app called uh, Quad. Uh, I've not, it, it will handle larger numbers of people. I'm not as sold on it as I am on, on GroupMe, but for the right people in the right, the right group, it works very well. Okay, well thank you.